Wow. All right, welcome. This is your first ever, your 12 minutes in the last week in Airflow. And really what we're trying to do here is just get the bright minds in the industry together and recap very quickly in video form some of the hot topics from the last week or two and share our insights out with you, the Airflow community. We have such a vibrant community. We think it's a great opportunity to bring folks together, collaborate on important topics and share with each other. Today, uh, I, am, uh, I have the great pleasure of having some great guests, but before we get started, my name is Andrew Ettinger and I run the go-to-market teams here at Astronomer where we're responsible for helping people get started and scale out with Apache Airflow. And I am here uh, with two wonderful guests that I would like to introduce themselves and then I'll kind of kick it off. Raj, you want to start with you? Yeah, I'm Raj and I had the field engineering team at Astronomer. Awesome, and Daniel? Hi, I'm Daniel. I'm on the uh, core Airflow team here at Astronomer and I'm one of the PMCs for Apache Airflow. Awesome. Thanks guys. Uh, and look, we're sponsoring kind of hashtag do you airflow. So all of our participants in these shows will also participate in this is we're really trying to fundamentally grow the adoption of airflow at scale. And I think if you look back over some of the hot news of the last couple of weeks, right, obviously Snowflake going public, a lot of other massive success also around JFrog and a whole bunch of others. And I think some of the trends clearly are high degree of automation, large data sets being managed at scale in the cloud, delivering a unified CI CD process to everything that runs as code inside of, you know, companies operations. And when you start to look at Airflow, Viraj, I thought it might be interesting for you to comment on some of the engagements and conversations we've had in the last week or so around that paradigm where I think a lot of folks start locally, which is a wonderful place to start. And then they increasingly wake up and say, you know what, I would really love this to be integrated into the rest of my processes and how I develop software all throughout our organization and have this run as a cloud native service. So maybe you could share some stories with what people are thinking, some of the ways in which we're helping them through some of those critical decision points. Yeah, totally. And I think you got, you really hit the nail on the head there where anytime a developer wants to start with something, they always um, they want to get it running locally first. You know, they don't have to bother anybody else on another team. Uh, they just want something that's easy to spin up locally and some docs and, uh, you know, kind of go to the races from there. And, you know, one thing that we really like doing uh, for our users is our CLI tool, which is uh, what we call the easiest way to get running with Apache Airflow locally. You know, you download our CLI tool. Um, it's wrap around Docker Compose. So it's really familiar tooling if you're, uh, if you're a developer nowadays. And it's just quick and easy. You don't have to worry about dependency management or anything. And it gets you running with Airflow. Um, you know, Outside of that, there's a lot of great things that the Airflow community is doing around the Airflow locally story. Um, you know, Daniel, if you want to talk about some of those projects, I feel like you have a much better view on them than I do. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, uh, we've been, it's been a pretty present question in the Airflow community for a pretty long time, which is how do I get a local Airflow running? Because there are some dependencies, you know, you need a backing database, you need a Celery if you're running the Celery executor. And so one thing we were really excited about uh, from the OSS community is the Apache Airflow Helm chart. So the idea here is that with any uh, Kubernetes cluster, uh, you'll be able to just do like a Helm create Airflow. Uh, this, uh, this is available in our source code right now. We're gonna be officially releasing it soon. And where this is really great. So first of all, like really proud of the astronomer, we actually like, this is a chart that we've been using for our customers for quite a while. And we finally got the donation process finished pretty recently. And this is basically a one command airflow running. So you're able to just pick the uh, variables you want to modify. And now if you're running a local Kubernetes cluster, you have a full airflow experience. Wow. That's pretty powerful. I think the other part that's super interesting when I look at this and, uh, you know, Viraj, I'll, I'll kind of kick it back to you for tales from the field and then we'll kind of circle back uh, to Dan and maybe on some of the scalability of this. But, you know, given that we run this as a native service ourselves and we've got an extremely talented team of SREs running probably the largest airflow cluster out there in the cloud, 
we've been able to package up those learnings as you know Daniel mentioned into a piece of really easy to deploy code. And when we uh, work on this with customers in the field, it resonates extremely well because there's a set of architectural decisions and paradigms that you need to contemplate when you go from a certain level of deployment getting started with Airflow and starting to scale out. And so Viraj, you know, maybe you could comment a little bit on some of what we've been hearing from folks out there as they've gone through that journey, gotten started and then relied on that expertise that we're giving back given how operationally sound some of our folks have been at scaling that out and bringing that knowledge back to the customers. Yeah, totally. You know, so when you're doing something locally, um, you just want it to work. And it's, it's a pretty, uh, pretty scope problem getting something working locally. Um, when something is running inside of your cloud or your data center or whatever, um, and it's running business critical SLA backed workflows, um, there's a lot of considerations you have to make between zero and getting started and also getting started to scaling. Um, so one of the ways we help our customers with that, as Andrew, as you were alluding to, is we run a multi-tenant cloud service and all the learnings we get from managing that large multi-tenant environment, we're able to directly funnel back to our customers. You know, so what are the metrics you should be collecting when you're upgrading Airflow? You know, how should you be organizing your services in different namespaces, different node pools, et cetera? Um, we are fighting these problems each day on our multi-tenant SaaS environment. And all the little edge cases and learnings we get from that, we're able to kind of easily pack in back to our Helm charts, as Daniel was saying, and really help some of our customers that are uh, running Airflow at pretty massive scale within their, organ within their organizations. You know, if you're a company and you have 60, 70 deployments of Airflow internally, um, there's a ton of little edge cases that come up with every group trying to accomplish their own use cases with Airflow. And that's exactly the reality we're living with, with our cloud, and we're really able to help our customers as they kind of traverse the journey uh, of growing airflow usage internally. Um, Daniel, I would love to kind of hear a little bit more about the Kubernetes particular aspect of that, especially as it relates to auto scaling, Airflow 2.0, uh, Kubernetes Executor, and so on. Yeah, I mean, so auto scaling has really been one of the big stories of Airflow. Uh, that was actually one of the main motivations behind the Kubernetes Executor was that previously with the Celery Executor, you kind of had to pre-provision workers and like auto scaling that was really difficult. Uh, one thing we actually released a couple, like in the last couple months, which I think is absolutely fantastic is uh, what's called the Kata Autoscaler. Kata is a Kubernetes CNCF project uh, that is the Kubernetes event-driven autoscaler. And we're able to actually now with Kata and Airflow, you can run the Celery Executor and you can auto scale uh, down to zero, uh, just based on how many tasks are running in the database, which is really, really powerful. Uh, we've also done a lot of work in terms of uh, removing a lot of unnecessary steps in the Kubernetes executor, which not only creates a much simpler interface for Airflow users, because now everything is using the Kubernetes API, but it actually also has led to a really significant speed up in the Kubernetes executor because there's a lot less um, translation from dictionaries into uh, Kubernetes native objects. So there's, with, and with Airflow 2.0, all of that goes on steroids. We've been doing speed testing on it and it's really fast. We're really excited about this and pretty much my job full time at this point is Airflow 2.0. So it's coming, it's, it's, definitely, it's coming soon. <laughs> Well, we won't hold you to any release dates here, Daniel. We, we certainly <laughs> wouldn't do that to you. Uh, but you know, it's interesting. I was actually, I got a question for you, Daniel, just to kind of go in reverse. I was reading a tweet earlier today and I don't want to mention names, but we all know Kubernetes is a fast moving and very powerful project and community. And we know very similar to Airflow, upgrades come out very frequently for various reasons with various new capabilities. And oftentimes it's hard to keep up with those upgrade cycles, even if you are a cloud provider running, right, it as a managed service for, uh, you know, a lot of their customers. And even from cloud provider to cloud provider, you could find varying, uh, you know, levels of upgrade paths on Kubernetes. Uh, and I was just wondering with some of the things that you mentioned, Daniel, how, if at all, does that help customers that might be using this service abstract themselves away from that? I mean, do they even need to worry about what version of Kubernetes they're running uh, behind all this? Or can they just say, hey, we don't have to worry about it relative to Airflow. Like we've got you covered with this new functionality regardless. Yeah, so I mean, uh, that, that to me is one of the big 
kind of, that, that to me is a really important part of the Airflow on Kubernetes story is that Airflow kind of allows for a lot of the flexibility of Kubernetes to be managed by system engineers and infrastructure engineers and have a lot of that be abstracted away from the Airflow user. So for example, uh, as of 1.10.13, we're gonna have pod template files. And so now between pod template files and defining queues in, with the Kata autoscaler, you, know, you have these lower level engineers that can really worry about what features are coming out with these Kubernetes upgrades. And the code that you're writing at the Airflow level is often pretty unaffected. Um, so, and it's also just worth mentioning that while Kubernetes does uh, upgrade a lot, you know, unless it's going to be a major release, it's not going to break anything as it's upgrading. It's going to usually just be adding functionality and then waiting until Kubernetes 2.0 2. comes out before it really just deprecates and or deletes things that are planned to be deleted. Yeah, so powerful. I mean, we see that with, with our customers all day long, right, Farage? I mean, it, we just in the past two weeks, it's been wonderfully talented Series A startups that really are going to change the world all the way to the you know, largest companies in the world that we've had the good fortune of speaking with that this has really resonated with. Faraj, any closing comments on uh, some tidbits or learnings from, from the last week or two with some of those customers in the field? Yeah, I just think the theme we keep hearing over and over is we want to be able to take advantage of all the great things Kubernetes gives us without having to make our data engineers or our data scientists or data analysts worry about Kubernetes. You know, you want that abstracted away because, you know, Kubernetes is just a tool. That's not, that's never the goal. The goal is to run your workloads with high amounts of confidence and scalability and so on. Um, so, you know, what we're really seeing is all the things that Airflow is doing at the core to kind of unleash Kubernetes and not kind of hold it back while also making it so that you don't need to be a certified Kubernetes architect to be able to get the Airflow Helm chart running. You know, we're really seeing those two forces come together in a way that's just really making community members happy, some of our customers happy and just driving general adoption of the core project. That's I'd really awesome. love to. No, go ahead, Daniel, sorry. No worries. I, I, I'd really love to just like piggyback on uh, what Viraj is saying and that that is, you know, I, I, I was a Kubernetes person before I was an Airflow person. And that really is one of the core tenets of Kubernetes is that if done, and this is something that Kelsey Hightower says all the time, which is if done correctly, your application level engineers should never have to actually touch Kubernetes. So let's take the Kata autoscaler, for example. Now, you know, you can have these infrastructure engineers create like 20 or 30 or 50 different types of queues that have different node affinities, po like uh, pods, like environment variables, all these different Kubernetes level configurations. And the data engineer, all they have to know is, if I wanna run this task, I send it to this queue and everything else is taken care of underneath. So that story of abstraction is really a powerful thing that Airflow offers. Makes it a true data platform. Exactly. Well, and then uh, along those lines, you're now integrating into the standards that companies have for their CI, CD process, their logging, their alerting, and you know everything that supports their ecosystem which is really important and gives you uh, significant advantages on your day two operations of this platform, or maybe even said another way, being able to treat Airflow as a true cloud native service, which many folks are really after given the power that Airflow has and the vast amount of data out there that folks are trying to now leverage in more in uh, meaningful ways, right? 100%. I mean, like, let's, let's take the most common example of like, Certain tasks require PI, have like personal information on them. Uh, Air, with, with Airflow now, if you, if you have your data, your infra engineers ensure that certain tasks can only run on certain uh, queues that are in those specific nodes, those system rules are written without the higher level engineers ever having to know them explicitly. Super powerful. Well, I'm going to hold true to my word. We're going to stop here, even though selfishly, like I could talk to these two gentlemen for hours, given the immense talent they have, the front row seats they have at this vibrant community, both from the customer perspective, the engineering perspective, and the practical use perspective. We will continue this, no doubt, but I want to end this uh, and keep it somewhat short. 
Daniel and Viraj, thank you so much for your insights. I hope everyone finds them as valuable as I do. We look forward to hearing from you soon and we welcome any feedback, comments, or suggestions for additional topics, additional speakers, and we welcome everyone to participate. So thank you. And we look forward to speaking with you soon. Have a good day. Thank you. Thanks everyone.